Operating on a posterior polar cataract comes with the inherent possibility of a breach of the posterior capsule at any point during the surgery. We as anterior segment surgeons need to be equipped with the know-how, the skill set of what is the technique that we need to follow should there be a breach in the posterior capsule and a nucleus drop. I'd like to share with you that how would I tackle a case with a posterior polar cataract, with a breach in the posterior capsule and a drop of half the nucleus. Clearly, this case is going to be taken over by the vitro retinal surgeons who will then perform a pass plana vitrectomy and retrieve the dropped nucleus. But what if we as anterior segment surgeons could present the case to the vitro retinal surgeon with an anterior chamber completely free of vitreous, the cortex clearly removed, an IOL placed in the sulcus with a posterior optic capture and secure wound. And of course, being mindful that at any step during the surgery, we do not endanger the vitreous base, the retina or the macula. Let's go on to seeing how this case was managed. So whilst performing a nucleus disassembly in this patient with a posterior polar cataract, after creating the second chop, I noticed a sudden appearance of red glow behind the nucleus fragment. Assuming that the posterior capsule had given away, I performed a viscofluid exchange and got the probe out of the eye. I now proceeded to evaluating what exactly was going on. Let's see how we took this further. I made an attempt to try and mobilize this nuclear fragment. And as you can see, it was quite difficult to move it around. I then used a second instrument to see if I could mobilize it to bring it into the anterior chamber. I found that it was rather difficult to mobilize it. With care and caution, I now introduced some viscoelastic into the eye and now a decision needed to be made as to how do we proceed further. So here are the two options. Option number one, possibly the most sensible of the two options, is converting to a non faco making a larger incision, bringing out the fragments from within the back, removing the cortex if there is no vitreous, else closing down the section with sutures, doing a limited anterior vitrectomy, removing the cortex with the IA mode of the vitrector, and then once the anterior chamber is clear of vitreous, placing a three-piece IOL within the ciliary sulcus with a posterior optic capture. Now let's consider option two. If you're fairly certain that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber and the rent is limited, now how do you know that? The initial size of the rent when created remains undisturbed. That way you know that there is no vitreous herniation. Second, you don't see peaking of the pupil. Third, you don't see any vitreous prolapsing out of the wound. Now, once you ascertain, as I did, that there was no vitreous in the anterior chamber, in this particular case, I chose to proceed with going in with low flow settings and holding on to the fragment in foot pedal two, bringing it up into the anterior chamber and emulsifying it. That was my plan. Now let's see what happened when I followed through on my plan. Moving back to the case, as you can see, a linear PCR is noticed. It appears to be a classic polar tear. I now introduce the probe with the irrigation off and as soon as I turn the irrigation on, watch what happens. The posterior capsular opening opens up and there is a drop of the proximal heminucleus. Now, if you ever have a dropping fragment, the one thing you do is never chase it and try and bring it up because that would cause excessive pull on the vitreous brace and the possibility of a future retinal detachment. Now, let's see how I managed this case. Since there is no vitreous herniation and my probe is anyway in the eye, I attempt to bring the nucleus up into the anterior chamber and emulsify it. I then proceed to do a viscofluid exchange, as you will see now, 
Now, this is very important to perform the viscofluid exchange so that no vitreous prolapses out when the source of the irrigation, in this case the phaco probe, is brought out of the eye. I introduce some dispersive viscoelastic into the anterior chamber to keep the vitreous away and then I proceed to performing a bimanual irrigation aspiration to remove the epinucleus and the cortex. This is what you will see in this part of the video. At all times, I'm mindful and I'm watching for any signs suggestive of a vitreous prolapse. Should I ever notice that, I would then move to a vitrector to help me perform the removal of the cortex with the irrigation aspiration mode of the cutter. As of now, everything seems to be fine, so I proceed with the irrigation aspiration itself. Always remember that as long as there's irrigation in the eye, there's always the possibility of hydrating the vitreous and it prolapsing. So intermittently, I like to inject some dispersive viscoelastic to keep the vitreous away. Upon the completion of one half of the irrigation aspiration, I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to removal of the irrigation from the eye and then I go on to removing the other half of the cortex. At this point, I noticed some resistance to the removal of cortex. Having some doubt that it could be vitreous, I now perform a viscofluid exchange prior to the introduction of triamcinolonastenide into the anterior chamber. Now here's how the injection triamcinolone is prepared. 1 ml of injection triamcinolonastenide contains 40 mg of the drug. We draw out only 0.1 ml in a tubercle syringe and dilute it 1 in 5. It is now ready for use. Triamcinolone stains the vitreous and therefore must always be used when you have any doubt of a vitreous prolapse. Now after staining it with tricot, I washed it out and I introduced viscoelastic and now I watch closely and I can see that single strand of vitreous that has prolapsed. The paracentesis incision needs to be enlarged to allow for ease of entry of the 20 gauge cutter. We then proceed with performing the limited anterior vitrectomy. As you can see, we start with cutting of the vitreous which is prolapsed out to the main incision and this is followed by the introduction of the 20 gauge cutter and a limited anterior vitrectomy is further performed to cut the prolapsed vitreous in the anterior chamber. This is followed by the viscofluid exchange one more time and now we have an anterior chamber free of vitreous and we are ready to consider implanting the three-piece IOL. In order to do so, we need to enlarge the 2.8 incision to a 3.2 mm incision with a slight widening of the inner lip. This is demonstrated here. We now move to the loading of the three-piece IOL. Please ensure that the haptics do not get damaged at any point during the loading. And I think the most important point to remember is that notice the orientation of the leading haptic because that will define the way in which the tip needs to be turned during the introduction of the lens in the ciliary sulcus. Let's move to the introduction of the lens in the eye. The anterior chamber needs to be filled with viscoelastic, good counter pressure afforded by a Sinsky hook, clear focus at all times on the rex's edge and a good illumination are absolute prerequisites prior to introduction of the IOL in the sulcus. Let's now watch the introduction of the three-piece IOL. Having ensured that the leading haptic is above the rex's edge, 
The IOL is supported on the undersurface with the Sinsky hook, while the rest of the IOL is injected into the anterior chamber and the cartridge withdrawn. With the help of a Googlin hook that hitches onto the trailing optic haptic junction, the IOL is rotated into the ciliary sulcus. This is followed by the posterior optic capture. You can see how the optic is pushed behind and both edges of the rexes come up in front of it. So when you complete a posterior optic capture, you have the haptics still within the sulcus and the optic under the rexes. This allows for a very stable positioning of the IOL. This is followed by the removal of the excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber using bimanual irrigation aspiration. It is important to ensure that we do not disturb the posterior optic capture whilst performing this maneuver. Upon the completion of the visco wash, we then proceed to hydrating the wounds. The main incision is then sutured with a single tenoproline suture which is then buried as demonstrated here. This ensures stable wounds and this stability would make the next surgery for the VR surgeon a lot more easier. And here we are at the end of our case. A stable IOL with a posterior optic capture, an anterior chamber free of vitreous and stable secure wounds. We now refer the patient to our vitreoretinal surgeons who will then perform a pass plana vitrectomy and fragment removal. The most important take home message here is that without endangering the posterior segment in any way, we as anterior segment surgeons, if we are able to perform a limited anterior vitrectomy, remove the cortex completely, place an IOL in the ciliary sulcus and stabilize it by performing a posterior optic capture and stabilize the wounds by suturing the main incision, I think the way in which we hand the patient to the posterior segment surgeon leaves them with the only responsibility now of going pars plana, performing a pars plana vitrectomy and retrieval of the dropped fragment. I hope you found this video tutorial useful. Thank you.